Take just a moment and imagine a color photograph. The scene is of a multi-level area in a museum where the 2015 through 2016 show focused on, among others, the work of Claude Monet. The exhibit was in the process of being installed at the time of the photograph. The vortex of the painter's ghost story centers on the photograph, which included a bearded older gentleman who was dressed smartly in a slightly too large for him suit and a hat. He was standing on a walkway, leaning lightly on the banister, observing the work in the area just below him. The man, unlike the other parts of the photograph that are in color, appears to be in black and white. If you would like to see the photo for yourself, we invite you to visit the Whispering Gallery Instagram page. The man in the photo is rumored to be perhaps the ghost of Claude Monet. We are at a crossroads of the story of the painter's ghost. There is no signpost to lead where we're going, but we'll share the path together and gather bits and pieces of the story into a magic snow globe of history and facts and shake them up and see what we're left with when the blizzard of details settle. So what is a ghost? From Merriam-Webster, the definition states that the seed of life or intelligent soul give up the ghost. The second is a disembodied soul, especially the soul of a dead person believed to be an inhabitant of the unseen world or to appear to the living in bodily likeness. Three, as a spirit or demon. Was it the baggy suit that resembled Monet's attire? Maybe it was the beard or the hat. When compared to the photos and videos we've seen of him, I'm not convinced it's the same guy. The man in the photo doesn't quite look like Claude Monet. It looks like a bearded older man watching what was going on. Maybe Santa on break on his own time at the museum? So I guess we could check in and say, what do you think and what do I think about um, like we were just talking about, he doesn't quite look like the same guy. If if you or you guys that are listening go look up, there's a video on Monet on YouTube. They've got live video of him. It must have been really uh, new to have live. Mm, a new technology. Yeah, so in seeing that and then seeing the picture of this guy, yeah, the beard length is about right and just kind of the stance before we start picking it apart with skeptical <laughs> thought and reasoning. What are your thoughts? Could it be him? I would like to believe it's him. I think it would be cool if it's him. Um, it would be, yeah. It is really weird, too. I know we mentioned it previously, but that he's in black and white, and yeah. the rest of the photo is color. They're claiming it hasn't been retouched, too. So Yeah, I think it's been looked at by a couple of experts, too. I could be wrong there, but yeah, I don't know. I think it would be interesting. Definitely a weird photo, though. For sure. So, how far are we willing to suspend disbelief for the mystery and romance of a ghost story, especially of a ghost story about someone like Claude Monet? We'll dig further into the museum from an architectural style, this and a handful of final notes on this very interesting artist who kept his painting supplies close and his flowers closer. Here's a quote from Claude Monet. My garden is my most beautiful masterpiece. So let's take a look at 1916, the year the Cleveland Museum of Art opened to the public. In 1913, they had been given two endowments, gifts of money from philanthropists, and earlier there had been a donation of land. In 1916, they opened. In 1916, there were big things afoot, from the unexpected shark attacks on the New Jersey coast that would later inspire the Jaws story. President Wilson created the National Park Service, and Hawaii Volcanoes National Park was created in Hawaii. And how crazy is this? The largest change in temperature recorded in 24 hours happened in Montana. 44 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 56 degrees Fahrenheit. That's insane. Yeah, this is, I mean, from like 2020, you know, really weird year. Uh-huh. And we're thinking how crazy it is. And, okay, and in 1918, um, the flu pandemic hit, and so... There were a number of crazy things going on during those years that probably made them very unsettled and feeling kind of weirded out about things in those temperature fluctuations. We just got lots of crazy things, though, going on right now, from global warming to the virus to, I mean, the fires in California right now, the um, hurricanes. 
It's Look. just just everything is going off right now. Yeah, and everybody you talk to, it seems like a billion crazy things are happening to them. Oh, yeah. Everybody has just got things happening. Not necessarily COVID. I mean, just... Just life things. Somebody may have passed away. Somebody may have, you know, gotten split up or, you know, so it's just mm -hmm. like, holy moly. There was a very sad and terrible moment and situation when Mary, an elephant, was killed for killing her handler. It was also the year with a majority of women voted into the council and mayor in Umatilla, Oregon. When you get a newspaper or like a, an elephant executed, that was really sad. So, the year as mentioned, 1916, brought with it the Cleveland Museum of Art into being. It was a year of sharks, crazy weather, and the year the doors to the white marble neoclassical Georgian Museum opened. It was one heck of a year, and it was 1916. So suppose it's a real ghost. What would the ghost of Monet want? Is he just watching over his art? How is he choosing to interact, standing there watching what's up? Would this be something typical? And I think you mentioned in the last podcast that Monet had said he would stay with his art during the war when things were happening in Normandy, and he said, no, I'll stay here, and I, you know, I'm, all, I'm not leaving. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe he would stick with his stuff. I think that's the most compelling case that he was attached to it and didn't want to leave it. And then, okay, so on the reverse side of the coin, if it's not him and the photo is untouched, what could the answers be? And why would the museum mention it might be Monet as they're pulling together a show on Monet and they're reaching their centennial year? <laughs> it's for sure convenient timing. Um, yeah, the there was a skeptic website. He was just like, well, duh. <laughs> he was like... <laughs> Of course they dressed somebody up like Monet and took a picture. I was like, okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> there, there is that, but I'm with you that it's this old building. When it opened, he was still alive. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to say. He died on uh, the 5th of December in 1926. Yeah, so it, there were, was a 10-year, I guess, overlay on that, on his mm -hmm. being alive and the museum being open. As far as the style of the museum... Mm -hmm. um, it's neoclassical Georgian, like we already mentioned, but this is from, let's see, the Georgian Architecture Wikipedia page. It says, Georgian architecture is the name given in most English-speaking countries. The most prominent style was Georgian because the Georgian style of architecture is the prevailing style of the 18th century. In Great Britain and the North American colonies, so named after George I, II, and III, it was derived from classical, renaissance, and baroque forms. And I'm pulling this from buffaloah.com, and that particular quote is from the Illustrated Dictionary of Historic Architecture by Cyril M. Harris from Dover Publications in 1977. And Georgian neoclassical is defined as neoclassicism named after George III in England. It encompasses both Palladian and Adamesque neoclassical styles. Diving further into that, Palladian is an earlier version of European neoclassicism based on the books of Italian Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio, who studied Roman ruins in Italy. And the Adamesque style is a later version of European neoclassicism based on Robert Adams' studies of excavations at Herculaneum and Pompeii. That's a okay. quote from uh, buffaloah.com. It's a buffalo as an architectural museum, is what their website header says. Lots of good information. Um, very 90s web design. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, that's. I'm glad they shared it, though. And that's interesting about where they came from once they dug it open. Totally. That makes a lot more sense as to why it was, like, called classicism or, like, related to the Greek because of where they were pulling this from. I don't think I have ever made that connection. You can see a picture. Again, this may be getting old, but we are visually focused storytellers. A lot of this, it helps to see part of the story when you're able to is going to the Instagram site and there's a picture of the museum and 
it looks like a small lake or body of water in front of it, so you can see what that looks like. The page dedicated to the traveling exhibition states, quote, while Monet remains the touchstone, the exhibition also looks broadly and deeply at the garden theme in modern art through the inclusion of paintings by other Impressionists, post-Impressionists, and having card artists from the early 20th century. The exhibition will lead visitors through the evolution of the garden theme, from Impressionist visions of light and atmosphere to retreats for reverie and dreams, sites for bold experimentation, sanctuaries of refuge and healing, and ultimately signifiers of a world restored to order, a paradise regained. Unquote. That comes from Painting the Modern Garden, Monet to Mathis, from the Cleveland Museum of Art. So it does sound like they were creating kind of a dreamy feel about that exhibit anyway. Mm -hmm. I bet it was a beautiful exhibit. That would have been neat to see. Um, it does seem... I'm not a skeptic by any means, mm -hmm. but it does seem that this uh, dreamy atmosphere would be the perfect place for a painter's ghost to appear on the scully side of things. <laughs> yeah, and having drawn him from his picture and it just doesn't entirely feel like him when you look at him. I think we were going to tie up a couple of loose ends on money real quick. Um, mm -hmm. We had, I just listened to the last two episodes because we've been so long. And to mention again here, I guess, we mentioned it on the, on the Instagram page, but my mom, Emily's grandmother, passed away in July and... So we got pretty derailed for a while, but we're back and trying to get things rolling again with the puck. It's good. I mean, I don't know. I think with COVID and getting exposed to COVID and my dad and I were both exposed at different times. So social distancing as well, kind of through a wrench in things. Talking about Monet's grave, um, it's in Giverny, France. So like we mentioned earlier, he died in 1926 and was buried in the churchyard in the village along with other members of his family. Um, and this is from francetravelplanner.com. As you leave Monet's house, turn left down the main street, aptly named Rue Claude Monet. You'll pass the Musée d'Impressionisme? Oof, Impressionism? Yeah. Um, I don't know. And it's Terra Cafe, as well as various galleries, studios, cafes, and shops. Wow. Along the route, you'll see beautiful flowers. After 10 or 15 minutes, you'll arrive at the Church of Giverny, whose official name is Eglise Sante Radigone di Giverny. Sorry if I butchered that. I did terrible with foreign languages. <laughs> Built mostly in the 15th and 16th centuries, this is the church that Monet attended and where he and his family are buried. The Monet family grave is behind the church, a white marble structure with lots of flowers topped by a cross. Claude Monet's stone is at the center front of the monument. The translation of the stone is, Here lies our beloved Claude Monet, born 14 November 1840, died 5 December 1926, missed by all. Oh, Very sweet. sweet. Yeah. Jinx. <laughs> <Just kidding. laughs> so one thing that I wasn't aware of about Monet was that he had cataract surgery. I guess he had been resisting for a little while having the surgery, and he finally decided to have the surgery in 1923, and afterwards he destroyed many of his uh, later canvases. He became acutely aware of changes in color perception in the eye that underwent the surgery, and he complained vigorously for more than a year that the world appeared either too yellow or too blue. And that information was pulled from jamanetwork.com. I had heard it was like kind of greenish, but that would make sense, the blue or yellow. It's the, yeah, it messed with his perception. That would be awful. I could see why he fought it for so long. As far as his palette goes, it seems like he most likely used a combination of lead white, cadmium yellows, vermilion, red alizarin, cobalt blue, cobalt violet, viridian green, ultramarine blue, emerald, and chrome greens may have been used. That's particularly analyzing his uh, lily paintings, but it does seem to be kind of a common palette that he reached for. That's kind of um, inspiring as far as not just aiming for, oh, I need this tone or this color or scrap blah. Get to know your colors and see what the most beautiful and what one speaks to you and your heart kind of thing. 
Maybe that's a little too corny, but... No, I think that's that's definitely true. I mean, I have a palette that I reach for almost exclusively because I have like five paints that I can mix almost anything with and pull in the occasional extra if I need it, you know? Yeah. Oh, also, uh, Monet was known to use ivory black in his earlier paintings, um, and many of his earlier paintings also demonstrate a more restrained and traditional painting approach. Um, he later departed from black in favor of mixing his own grays and blacks using the other colors on his palette, which I think is very um, typical of artists as they mature. When you're first starting out, you reach for a lot of black to get those darker colors in the shadows, but as you grow and mature as an artist, you realize that shadows aren't necessarily black. In fact, they typically aren't. <laughs> I've been noticing that on the piece I'm working on right now, mm -hmm. that when I add black, it it's off. Mm -hmm. And it's too dark. And when I work with like darker reds and dark, like you're saying, um, alizarin crimson, mm -hmm. that that's more what I'm looking towards and I can blend it in with other dark colors. Totally. So yeah, yeah. so things to learn. That little bit about including ivory black is from drawpaintacademy.com and then backslash paint dash like dash Claude dash Monet. The book of Monet's palette is where I read about him having the garden. It looks like it was a two and a half acre vegetable garden at the other end of the village. It had its own head gardener, a young man named Floramond, whose job was to grow a vast number of crops and deliver them at their peak freshness to Monet's kitchen. The beds were laid out in large squares and rectangles, all hedged with fragrant, herbaceous peonies, for Monet liked to fill every room of his house with them when they bloomed. Against the walls, Monet had lines of cold frames to overwinter hardy crops like lettuce and cabbage, and to gain extra early crops of warm season crops like zucchini, squash, and melons. The walls also provided support for a large number of espalier fruit trees, notably apples, pears, peaches, apricots, plums, and figs. These not only saved space by growing flat against the wall, but they benefited from reflected light and frost protection from the heat of the wall. We know what the vegetable garden looked like because of a painting titled Monet's Formal Garden, painted by the American Impressionist painter Willard Metcalf. As a student studying in Paris, he cycled into Giverny and knocked on Monet's door to request permission to paint his flower garden. Although Monet refused the request, saying that he was the only person allowed to paint his flowers, he gave permission to Metcalf to paint his vegetable garden and invited him in for lunch. That painting came on the market about 15 years ago, and it is a work of oils painted on wooden board. It's also featured in the cookbook, Monet's Palette Cookbook, yes. Recipes from His Kitchen Garden. And this was pulled from buckscountymag.com, and it was written by Derek Fell. The bit that they have in the Monet's Palette Cookbook says that hidden away at the other end of the village was his bountiful two-acre vegetable garden. It was cared for by his potager, uh, potager, I don't know how to say that, gardener, Floramond, like you said, who lived at the Maison Bleu, the blue house near Monet's home, containing a constant supply of fresh produce during the growing season for Monet's family and many illustrious guests. They talk about the colors of different things in like his bright yellow dining room. The pink house. Was it the kitchen blue? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so, wow, that's a pretty picture. That's the painting by Willard Metcalf. Will you post that one? That bit that I just read about um, about the kitchen was written by Meryl Streep in the foreword of the book. He also, I believe, kept chickens right outside the kitchen at the house, so eggs were fresh. And that just sounds cute on that neighborly app or a neighbor app that they have out there. Uh -huh. Somebody had like fancy chickens that had gotten loose. <laughs> the guy that posted about it talked about the little feathers around their ankles. Oh. He's like, they're very adorable. I don't know where they go. He's like, I've tried knocking on doors, but they're just hanging out in the lush green vegetation. As and I think I posted that Dad and I tried a recipe out of here. Yep, I, this is what we made. Camembert scrambled eggs with tomato and chives topped with asparagus and morel and mushroom saute. <laughs> what can we get in Utah? <laughs> it is not morel mushrooms. Yeah. And um, camembert cheese uh not so much either they were getting you know their next shipment in it'd be in on tuesday for sure and i'm like uh-huh sure so we made it with brie 
um, eggs, tomato, I believe from our garden because they were starting to come in. Didn't have any chives, but we did get fresh asparagus, which was amazing, and used button mushrooms. Well, we couldn't be exactly like Monet. We, we tried. Basically, you're making scrambled eggs, and then once you put the cheese into the eggs, once they've kind of set, you're not making scrambled eggs that have any sort of... They're very fluffy because you're, you're, um, you're not pressing them to smash them. You're not trying to brown them. You're just trying to get them to set. And then that's when you start kind of stirring in the other stuff. They called for 12 large eggs, so we uh, scaled that back to six. And uh, for the creme fraiche that they call for, we used sour cream with a touch of milk and the tiniest bit of sugar and made our own so-called creme fraiche. I would recommend getting the cookbook. It's a fun read and it's kind of fun to try the recipes that made other people happy years ago and that worked with his garden and his fresh eggs from the, the chickens. <laughs> so. It just kind of, you know, it's kind of a fun and makes you happy to see how they did it. If you'd like to see Monet's formal garden painting, it will also be on our Instagram page. The dogs are finishing their treats, so it is about time to be done. Shotzi's mm -hmm. over there getting a good drink. So happy moments. I haven't really thought through that. Being able to get together again. We had a picnic on my birthday. Mm -hmm. That was fun. Having spaghetti in 90 degree weather <laughs> at the park. <laughs> ill-advised but still fun yes good, good memory and we were on a frisbee golf track that was kind of fun dodging who knew people were using it it was completely dead when we got there yeah <laughs> we'd like to say thank you to all the support that we've gotten from wikipedia the cleveland museum of arts webpage google and just you know the information we've been able to find from books and each other so yeah that's that's been kind of a fun thing to explore and whether you believe it was Monet's ghost, or if you believe that it was a marketing stunt for driving visitors and interest in the museum, you know, it's still a fun romantic story to consider. I guess everybody can make their own mind up about it. All right, so for our next episode, um, I'll be covering the story of Circe, the Greek sorceress, and Mom will be covering the Oracle of Delphi. Yes. We invite you guys to check out our Instagram page. Which is at Whispering Gallery Podcast. We are on Facebook, but it's much easier to reach us or interact with us on Instagram or through our Gmail, which is whisperingcontact at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you with ideas for the podcast, information about what we've been talking about. If you know something you'd like to share about it, maybe we missed something, um, we'd love to hear from you and share that. We will talk to you in two or three weeks again when we update on these new topics. So see ya, Em. See ya.